I'm Bill Zogby. I know I met you the first day if you were there. I'm the chair of cardiology here, and I think this afternoon is going to be fun because it's going to be about structural heart disease. So all valves, mostly the important valves, aortic and mitral, and uh, to get us through mitral regurgitation, Dr. Little, who heads our valve program and needs no introduction. Steve. Thank you, Dr. Z, and thank you for coming, Dr. Z. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll take you through uh, kind of an approach to mitral regurg uh, in 10 minutes-ish. All right, so this is the objective of what I want to talk to this group about. We'll spend just a minute talking about anatomy, which is critical to understanding MR. We'll discuss the pathophysiology of MR. Uh, we'll sort of relate the anatomy to the imaging, which is really what all our imaging modalities do. And then finally, we'll come up with a clinical approach to MR. Okay. So the mitral valve, this is a, a little graphic I've shown for a few years, but it really depicts sort of what the valve is supposed to be doing. So on the long axis, you the valve has got to get out of the way, let the diastolic bolus in. It's actually supposed to direct flow to the apex with a bit of a swirl, and that swirl is important, uh, that helical flow, to actually get efficient outflow. So it's not just a dumb valve that opens and gets out of the way. It actually directs flow like a baffle. Uh, and look at the baffle out the LVOT. So the ventricular surface of the antimitral leaflet is actually the beginning of the LV outflow tract. So that's important to recognize. When you look at the valve in the short axis, just the point of this is to emphasize how different the anterior and posterior leaflets are. The analogy that I've heard is that the anterior leaflet just sort of falls into the ventricle like a toilet seat, upside down. Uh, and the back here is more like an airbag, uh, and it comes smashing in and out. So it really shows where the dynamic elements of the annulus are. So the, the posterior parts of the annulus are very dynamic. The anterior annulus is not dynamic. Where does the MAC occur? Annular calcification? All back here, because this is where stress and strain are replicated for uh, a billion heartbeats. So just a quick sort of graphic to give you an idea of what the valve is actually doing when it moves. Uh, this is a nice little video from Minnesota. Um, it's a sort of a de-blooded uh, uh, de heart. That's probably not a real word. Um, but they have all these graphics. And if you Google University of Minnesota Medtronic Labs, they have all these terrific graphics where they take a sort of a newly dead heart, they reanimate it with saline, and they make it beat. The point of this video is really to show, sorry, the co-optation zone. And that's important. It's an entire zone. It's not a point. It's not a line. It's several millimeters of co-optation uh, between anterior and posterior leaflet. And that's what's required to have competence. You're not just going to have the two leaflets touch and be competent. They really have to overlap and give that tissue plane, and that's what that video is supposed to demonstrate. So the anatomy of the mitral valve, you know, it's not just leaflets. It's a whole subvalvator apparatus. You've got to have all these things in play, um, doing the right thing, and in the right uh, geometry for the valve to actually work, particularly all the subvalvator apparatus. Okay, So the fellow's uh, trivia, why is it a mitral valve? Because it has a bishop's mitre. There it is, right? This mitre even comes with cords. So this is kind of where the, where the word comes from. But just to recognize how important all the subvalvator stuff is, it's not like the aortic valve where it's just leaflets. There's a lot below the valve that really matters. Um, so this is the anatomy question for this group. Um, and I've asked this for a few years, and I know the answer that you're going to give me, but I'm going to ask you anyway. So this is the, the way this is set up is this is the surgeon's view looking down on the mitral valve. The aortic valve is here. This is the posterior leaflet. This is the anterior leaflet. The question on these three versions are where are the pap muscles? So option A, the pap muscle is sort of the sort of mid portion of the anterior leaflet, mid portion of the posterior leaflet. They only send cords to their respective valve halves. Option B, the, the um, pap muscles are over here on the commissures, and they each send their cords to both anterior and posterior leaflets, but none of the cords cross the midline. Or option C, the pap muscles are really so they're both under the anterior leaflet, and they send most of the cords to the uh, anterior leaflet and just a couple of cords to the posterior leaflet. So those are three options. Who goes, and this is a, uh, a show of hands. Uh, this is old school. So option A, option B, option C. Yeah, it's always split between B and C. The answer is B. Um, so this is important to recognize. So when, when you're talking about chordal rupture, when you're talking about pap muscle rupture, you're trying to imagine what is the effect of that on the valve, uh, it's important to recognize. It also gets very important to recognize when you start talking about structural interventions on these valves. If you're going to put a clip here, it kind of makes sense that you put it where there's no cords, which is right down the middle. Uh, 
you start putting clips over them on the sides where there's a ton of cords, it gets more complicated. So it's important to sort of get this basic anatomy early in your training. If you didn't believe me, here's another sort of image that shows the same thing. Um, again, more concentration, all of the cords uh, coming, none crossing the midline. The other anatomy that exists behind the valve, right? So you've got a coronary sinus, you've got a circumflex artery. Um, it's important to recognize that all of that's there. All of that can be occasionally impacted by a surgeon or a surgeon's misadventure at the time of a surgical uh, valve replacement. So these are things that are sort of subject to injury uh, when you intervene using catheters or surgery. Um, the final word on the nomenclature, the posterior scallops are labeled 1, 2, 3, so P1, P2, P3, starting laterally, moving medially. So if you're out here with the uh, appendages, it goes 1, 2, 3. Anterior generally has no true scallops, but we call them 1, 2, 3, just to sort of match the posterior leaflet, okay? So that's basic anatomy that is important to know. Uh, and, you know, this sort of leads to when we talk about primary MR, it's really a problem of the valve. This is sort of one graphic that shows, um, you know, basically this is simple little chordal rupture, that's all. This is chordal rupture, a couple of cords and some leaflet thickening. Uh, this is much more leaflet thickening with rupture. And this is, you know, diffuse leaflet thickening and redundancy of all scallops, that's termed Barlow. So all of this is sort of a continuum of, of a thing that's been termed fibroelastic deficiency. Uh, it's myxomatous changes to the valve, some very mild, some very severe. Um, but just to recognize that this is all primary MR, so the leaflets are the problem. We do a lot of 3D imaging now to understand the valve. This is a very normal mitral valve, just to sort of demonstrate this is the same orientation I've been showing you. Aortic valve is here, P1, P2, P3, way over here, and this is the anterior leaflet over here. This video doesn't matter if it plays or not. This is severe MS, rheumatic MS, commissures are gone. Uh, I think Dr. Kurlmeyer, are you talking about MS? Right, you hear about that shortly. That's sort of an extreme example of MS. So, in the distinction of what are the different types of MR, so primary leaflet, these are two different patients. This one has a chordal rupture and a prolapse of P2. So that's a primary MR, this is a different example. This is a ventricular problem. This is somebody who clearly has LV systolic dysfunction with tethering of the leaflets. And you can see there's going to be MR here. And this is sort of the ultimate in primary ventricle. This is a, this is a pap muscle rupture. These are two heads of the papillary muscle, and this would be a flailing uh, scallop. And this entity does also exist, and it sort of confounds some of the, the challenges in the characterization. Is This is a mixed disease. This is somebody who has lumpy, bumpy mitral leaflets, but there's also restriction. So these two entities can coexist, generally in elderly patients. But recognize now that everybody should be categorized in the imaging world as either primary or secondary or mixed. It's not okay anymore to just say there's MR without mentioning the type of MR and ultimately the etiology. So here's a case, 58-year-old gentleman comes into the ER, and he's short of breath, he's hypoxic on room air, he's a little hypertensive, um, his carotid upstroke is sort of low rise, Position of maximal impulse is enlarged and laterally displaced. He does not have a left peristernal lift. He's got a soft S1, normally split S2. And he's got a systolic murmur and an early diastolic murmur and an S3 and a little edema. I won't call you out and make you interpret that physical exam since you all know the topic. But this is sort of the classic exam of MR. There's a few things like the PMI enlargement, which suggests a big LV. Uh, the diastolic murmur, which suggests severe MR because it's so much flow goes back, but all that flow has to come back in, gives you an E wave um, on your echo and also an audible S3. This really ancient imaging modality, some of us still do, um, occasionally, um, but this sort of demonstrates the, the, the sort of classic chronic severe MR. You have an enlarged cardiopericardial silhouette, so a big LV. You also have an enlarged LA, and you have uh, venous congestion. So. There's only one valve lesion that all by itself will give you a big LV and a big LA, and that's MR. It's a volume load of both left-sided chambers. So this is shown here, the pathologic stages of MR. This is sort of where we start. You've got an LA pressure of 10. You've got an LV volume of 150 mils. You've got a forward flow of 100 mils. Then something bad happens, like a chordal rupture or endocarditis or some event. All of a sudden, you've got acute MR. So your LA pressure goes up from 10 to 25. Pulmonary venous pressure goes up, now you've got symptoms, 
Uh, you've got 70 mils going backwards, so your forward flow falls. You generally also have fatigue because you've lost some stroke volume. And immediately, you're going to have an increase in your LV volume because that regurgitant volume has to come back in. So that's what happens quickly. Over time, there's compensation. LA, LV gets even bigger. LA gets bigger, so for the same volume, the pressure goes down. That's why patients feel better over time because the pressure drops. The forward, forward full stroke volume finally goes up because the LV total volume has gone up. But ultimately, you get chronic decompensated. So now the forward volume starts to fall, LA pressure starts to go back up, and this is sort of the natural history of MR. Um, we rarely can identify this phase. We don't have tools to predict who's going to have acute MR. Uh, we generally encounter folks over either in the acute or the compensated phases. And a lot of the guideline work and clinical work is trying to prevent them going from chronic compensated to chronic decompensated. And that's where we have guidelines to help us know when to send somebody for an intervention. Really, the goal is to prevent the bottom right quadrant. OK. So functional MR, we've talked a little bit about uh, primary MR. Functional MR is this etiology. So this is your sort of normal ventricle on the left here. Uh, pap muscles are in the right spot. Cords are the right length. Leaflet coaps just the way it should. You have an infarct. You have a lateral and apical displacement of the papillary muscle wall. It's not necessarily pap muscle ischemia, but the wall the pap muscle is attached to has remodeled. The cords did not get longer to compensate. They're kind of stuck at their length. Now you have tethering of the leaflet. And on the echo, you have this finding. Uh, should play. It did play. There, it's not playing. But you get this little hockey stick of the anterior leaflet, and you get some MR. So the cords are relatively too short. That's one way to consider functional MR. Uh, this is sort of an extreme case. This is a 91-year-old remote cab, new, new onset dyspnea. He has two problems. The aortic valve doesn't open, and the mitral valve doesn't close. That's about as bad as that gets. Um, if you think through where the blood's going to go. Um, so he's extreme operative risk, and this is in the interventional world, this is a real challenge. Do you taver this person? Do you mitral clip this person? Do you do you both at the same time? Which one do you do first? Um, these are real world challenges today. But this is a nice example of functional MR because he's got this sort of, this little hockey stick. I'm a Canadian, so I think of hockey sticks, uh, of the anterior leaflet. And what that is is you don't see the cord, but you see the effect of the cord. The cord isn't letting that leaflet lay out flat and give you the co-optation you need. Okay? This is a different patient. So this is a transthoracic echo. You can see almost akinesis of the infralateral wall. And if you drew a line from this part of the mitral annulus to this part, there's this visible tenting area. And there's a good, nice studies to show the volume of tenting relates to the severity of MR. So this is another example of functional MR on the basis of a bad ventricle. This is the color. And the question we get to, finally, is, is this MR significant? And there's a lot of tools uh, in the ECHO toolkit to try to figure out what that is. And we have these great guidelines, which you don't have time to go to in detail today. But they're first written in 2009, Dr. Zogby, sorry, 2003. Dr. Zogby chaired that one. And then the version 2.0 uh, dropped last year um, with the inclusion now and updates of 3D ECHO and cardiac MRI. So you do, all of you need to find these guidelines and read these guidelines. They're, they're bread and butter for the ECHO lab. Know that there's a whole bunch of very specific criteria for severe MR. There's other specific criteria for mild MR. Uh, and then there's quantitative tools you apply when it's moderate or indeterminate. True indeterminate recommendations to go to TEE or cardiac MRI. So we won't go through those in detail, but there's the reference. Zogby, Jace, 2017. Uh, you got to all read that in detail. So this is sort of the, uh, the basic premise of, of the guideline, give you some numbers to recognize. If the LV systolic function is normal, know these numbers. Regurgitant volume more than 60 mils, regurgitant fraction more than 50%. That's your cutoff for severe MR, OK? Um, almost done. So the other thing to think about when you're doing quantitation of MR is recognize that not all MR happens through the entire cardiac cycle. Some is just at the beginning, some is just at the end, some is holosystolic. You recognize that when you listen in the murmur effect, but also in the flow effect and the consequence. So this is an example of a patient with holosystolic functional MR uh, on this one here. And if you look at the M mode, the color M mode, MR happens throughout all of systole. This is a completely different etiology. This is prolapse. Option one was functional. This is prolapse, so this is primary. But it's still holosystolic. So the timing doesn't tell you the etiology. And then this third one here, this is somebody with prolapse, but the prolapse happens late. And if you look at the difference between the QRS and the onset of MR, 
half of systole is already gone. So it's a very late systolic event. And you have to recognize that when you do get to quantitation. So remember, timing matters when you're in the echo lab sorting this stuff out. So this is the final slide. This is the recommended approach to mitral regurgitation, both clinically and imaging. The first question is, what's the mechanism? Uh, all too often, we go straight to quantitation. But and you need to comment on why is there MR? What are the consequences of MR? LA volume, LV volume, pulmonary hypertension, AFib, uh, these are all consequences of MR. You've got to look for all of those things. Um, is severe MR present? That's the quantitation we talked about. And then the next level, final question as clinicians is, um, you know, then we ask, is it time for a surgical or catheter-based intervention? Does the patient meet criteria to move on and, and do something about it? So I'll stop there. My time is up. Uh, there's my Twitter handle for the Twitter audio in the room. Thanks. Thank you, Steve, very much. Very nice, very clear.